Hey everyone, welcome to another video and today I'm covering climbing at differing ranks. So I get a lot of questions saying, Curtis, is VOD review even important? When I do a VOD review, how do I even know what to look for? I feel very overwhelmed. I don't know where to direct my attention. And even when I pinpoint something, I don't really know how to improve at it. So what I've actually done is gone ahead, broken down rank by rank, specifically what you should be looking for as if I were coaching a client at that specific rank, whether you're silver to gold, gold to platinum, platinum to diamond, or whether you're a diamond to master, or even master to challenger, what I would look for as a coach coaching someone at this level. Now, there is going to be a lot of theory, and you have to bear with me. I didn't really know how else to structure this video, but one thing, guys, before I dive straight in, even if you're a platinum player, I don't recommend that you just skip to the platinum section. At least watch from the gold section, or if you're a gold player, watch from the silver section. There will be things that you do at differing levels. So whether you're a diamond player, you, you might actually have specific elements of your gameplay that are gold level. Or if you're a platinum player, you may have elements of your gameplay that are at a silver level. So it's important to get context on what things I cover at specific ranks to give you guys just more understanding of VOD reviewing overall. So don't just skip straight ahead, guys. And I'm not just saying that to increase my view time. Genuinely, that's genuinely what I feel. And uh, I hope you enjoy the video, guys. So diving straight ahead, I want to quickly talk about the structure of the video. So first of all, we're going to cover the theory behind VOD reviewing. Then we're going to cover tips for actually improving your VOD reviews. And then we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Then we're going to talk all the way from silver through to challenger, what to look for, how to improve at these specific skills, trends at these ranks, and advice for climbing out of that specific rank. And note, guys... This video is great if you are stuck at any rank because I will be highlighting things that you may not be thinking about at all. So keep that in mind when going through this video. So starting off with the importance of, of VOD reviews, guys, I recommend a combination of like the OBS point of view as well as the league replay. Now, the OBS point of view is great for seeing how you pan your camera. When do you pan your camera? Do you even pan your camera at all? How are you, what information are you soaking in? You can also see the accuracy of your clicks and how you're cl clicking within the lane. You can also see, I can see if you're using locked camera, all these things. It's important to see what information you are actually soaking in. The league replay is very important as well because this is going to be how you improve your jungle tracking and how you your hypothesis hypothesis sorry on of how the side lanes are playing out are actually tested. So if you have a theory about this jungle matchup or this jungle path or the way the side lane actually plays out, you can't really see if that was correct through the OBS point of view because you aren't able, you're not panning your, your camera and constantly seeing how the lane is playing out. So it's very important to look at both. Now, remember guys that league is actually like chess. It's not like a traditional sport like basketball. And what I mean by this is that in chess, the first move that you do has consequences on the entire game. Whereas basketball, there's always a reset. You know, there's quarter time, half time or whatever. And even during the game, it goes to one side, then everyone gets to reset the position, then goes to another side. League is very different. So this is why I highly recommend putting a disproportionate amount of time and energy focusing on the first 10 minutes. A massive mistake people do is that they skip to like 20 minutes and say, oh here, mid game macro. Why, why do I lose this game? That's just not the case. Even if you were ahead or behind in this specific moment or, or whatever state it was in, you should be directing all your attention on how can I get ahead in the first 10 minutes of the game. Your first few decisions dictate largely if you're going to win or lose that game. So um, that's my theory and I truly, truly believe in that. And it's really helped me climb personally. And a frequently asked question I get in my Discord as well is, how often or which replays should I watch? Now, the answer is that I believe that you can get value out of every single VOD. Obviously, if someone AFK is at like five minutes, then you're not really going to get too much value. But even if you're watching the first few minutes of the lane to see, you know, how you manage the first few waves or you're trading in the first few minutes or did you complement your jungle at the early scuttle fight, all these little small details, you can get, there. there is a bunch of morsels of information even in the first few minutes. Now, for tips for VOD reviewing, guys, these are all really important and things that I've learned over time, both as a player and as a coach that have helped me level up my game, but other people's games. Now, the feeling with a, within a game is absolutely essential to identifying what is and what isn't muscle memory. 
and it helps you identify key areas to look at. So what I mean by that is when you're actually going over the OBS recording, there's going to be moments in the VOD where you're so men you're so invested. If you're actually focusing, you you'll realize, ah, here I felt. I felt really off, you know, I just did, this, this did, didn't feel right. Whether you felt scared, you felt threatened, you felt confused, um, there was something wrong. So listen to your intuition, listen to your subconscious mind telling you that's, that that's something that you need to look at. So your mind is trying to tell you, Curtis or whatever your name is, direct attention here. This is something that you should probably look at. And for example, you'll realize, ah, here I felt threatened because I wasn't positioning appropriately or I f maybe my mindset on how I was approaching the, the lane was wrong or maybe I wasn't warding appropriately or maybe I wasn't leaning appropriately. Like you'll notice that the feelings are directly tied to what you're doing in the game. So listen to your feelings, guys, when going through a VOD review and use that to identify what you're comfortable with or uncomfortable with. 20 percenters versus one percenters i'll use this a lot throughout this video so i kind of want to clarify it here what i mean by this is the 20 percenters are the things that you know they're going to drastically change 20 percent of your your level of play so for an example a 20 percenter would be csing or trading very key fundamental parts of uh the mid lane um, winning lane essentially. Whereas the one percent is all the small little details that you know if you should start to put attention towards if you're diamond or master tier. So maybe this is out of game things or like tempo assessment, you know, little things like jungle tracking or optimizing warding, all these small little one percenters that add up. Um, but if you're a gold player or silver player, you really want to be only focusing on the 20 percenters. Now, reverse engineering, this is something that I created myself. I, I, I just kind of deemed it reverse engineering. I don't really know. I didn't hear it anywhere else, and I found it a really great way. Now, I want to clarify here as well is that reverse engineering is a tactic I use to help identify things going or how a certain set of plays actually occurred. So, what I'll do is I'll go to a death, for example, my first death of the game, and then I'll go backwards and say, what led to this? Was it because I wasn't utilizing my vision trinkets? Was it because I didn't assess range properly? Was it because I wasn't jungle tracking? Was it because my mana conservation was poor? You can actually see by reverse engineering, rather than just watching the VOD linearly, you can see a lot clearer how that specific thing happened. And it's the same thing when getting a kill. You can get a kill and be like, oh, how did I solo kill this person? What led to this kill? So it's a great way at identifying your strengths and weaknesses. Now, let's pick one or two, two things to focus in on, guys, because again, I'm going to be talking a lot about a lot of things, a lot of details. You can get a little bit overwhelmed or brain overload starts to happen. So just pick one or two things, guys. You can refer to this VOD multiple times. And keep in mind, guys, that a player, and I mentioned this before, is that a player can be really good in one area, which actually compensates for his other areas. So he might be diamond level in trading on this specific champion, but his map awareness is at maybe a silver level. So maybe they're like a mid platinum player. So don't just view it that I'm a gold player, so I'm gold at every single aspect of the game. Or I'm a platinum player, and I'm platinum at every single aspect of the game. We have certain elements of our gameplay that are better than others. So keep this in mind, and this is why I recommend if you're a diamond player, don't just skip to the diamond section, you should look at the platinum and probably gold section as well. So let's actually start with silver, guys. So we'll start by talking about the key areas to assess and improve. So when I'm looking at a VOD in silver, the first thing I like to think about is CSing. Specifically, how are they preparing CS? Are they not preparing any of the CS? Because we know, as a mid laner, you should be trying to prepare and make one of the the minions obviously lower than the others to help you CS. This is actually why a lot of players miss CS. And literally, are their eyes looking at the CS? So in the VOD, and when you're looking at your own VOD, guys, you can literally see, ah, uh, here, I wasn't, I literally wasn't seeing which minion was low. My, my attention at all, I wasn't focusing on any attention towards the minions. Um, are they assessing which one's getting targeted? Because as we know as well, caster creeps and minions, they target a specific minion, and you can literally see the little laser beams. Um, and are they actually repositioning for CS to ensure they don't get traded on? This is all just bread and butter stuff, and you'd be surprised most silver players don't do any of this with CS, and this is why they, they're not comfortable with CSing. And it takes time, but if you go through these things like I'm highlighting now, you'll realize um, ways to improve your CSing very efficiently. And also it's important, guys, to figure out the mentality to how they are viewing CS in general. Remember, guys, that one 
kill is worth around 15 CS. I don't know if that number's correct. It's around 15 CS worth of gold. So if you miss 15 CS, you've basically missed a kill. So keep in mind that CS is very important. And a lot of the time I found when coaching silver people, and why I'm not a massive fan of coaching silvers, is that um, they don't actually understand how important CS is as a, as a concept. So the mentality behind CSing is very important as well. And then we begin to talk about, you know, basic trading patterns and understanding of their champion's kit. So very basic ability usage. So, you know, sin if you play Syndra, knowing that the more balls that are on the ground, the more damage that your ultimate's going to do, and knowing that if you do your ultimate first, then your E, your, it's a lot easier to hit the stun. Um, this is also knowing where, you know, how certain cooldowns actually operate. So if you have one ability that's got a really long cooldown, you don't want to be using it very often. For example, if you're playing Vlad, you don't want to be spamming your W, you want to be using it very, um, you know, very frugally in a way. Um, and so which ability they want to trade with and how that differs to the enemy champion. So for example, um, if you're playing Orianna or Syndra, a lot of players, they don't actually know which is their bread and butter trading ability and how they should be utilizing that to take favorable trades. So again, very basic trading patterns. And ask yourself this question, guys. When you're playing a champion, if you don't know how to take a favorable trade on your champion, then that's a big problem. And again, notice this is all very basic, fundamental stuff, all right, guys? Um, and then next, very basic champion identity. What are the key strengths and weaknesses and spikes? So if you're playing a champion like Orianna, we know that there's trade-offs, right? Your key strengths is that you have long range. Um, you can like poke them down slowly, but your weaknesses is that you're very uh, immobile and you're very vulnerable. So if someone gets onto you, it's going to be hard to escape. So you've got to abuse that range advantage. And yes, I know it's very simple stuff, but you'd be surprised people walking up in auto attack range as Orianna, um, doing things that just don't make sense at all. Um, in not coherent to that champion's identity and knowing the key spikes, you know, are you an early spiking champion or late game spiking champion? So this will again dictate roughly how you want to navigate the game, guys. And then looking at the quality of the trades, why are they taking court, court, uh, poor trades? And we'll come to this a bit later on. Um, more things here, basic resource conservation. Are they spamming abilities way too much? Like you'll notice a lot of silver players is that they'll spam abilities just again or again and again, and they'll just go oom, and then they'll just be sitting in lane with no mana. So keep in mind, guys, if you're a silver player, uh, League is all about resource management, especially if you're a mid laner. So if you're playing Orianna or Syndra, you don't want to be using your QWE combo all the time. Generally, your bread and butter trading ability is the Q, poke, poke, poke. You know, if you have a lot of mana, maybe you can use the W and E. Um, just things like that, just basic resource conservation, guys. And are they even looking at mana costs and their current mana pool at all? Is that something that they're considering at all? And again, maybe that's something they need to look at as well in their VODs. Um, are they using trinkets off cooldown or are they just literally sitting on two trinkets all the time? Are they buying pinks at all? Even if you're not going to get a lot of use because, you know, their map awareness isn't good, it's still a great habit to get into is just to use the trinkets. Basic itemization, rune understanding. How does the rune work at a very basic level and items work at a very basic level? For example, you've got a rune like Comet, Arcane Comet versus Electrocute or Morellos versus Leandris. You don't need to go into the, this really crazy details, but as we know, Comet is procced off you know, hitting an ability, whereas Electrocute, you've got to hit three abilities. So understand how that works. For example, if you're playing Syndra, how Comet would work. Uh, if you're playing Syndra, how Electrocute would work. So that would dictate what sort of trades you want to take at a very, very basic level. Um, and are they playing with locked camera? This is the first thing we basically need to fix if you're a silver player because locked camera is going to severely limit your awareness. And again, it's something you need to address now before... Um, things get carried away. And are they utilizing pings at a very basic level? You know, if do they know how to do a missing ping, uh, on my way ping, danger ping, just very basic pings, especially when the enemy is roaming. It can be a very uh, good habit to get into uh, very early on. Now, improving at these key areas, guys, to improve at trading, I actually recommend that you watch a guide or high-level player. Just what? Just take trades. Only focus on their trading. And in the, few, in the first few minutes of that VOD, um, what I want you to do is notice a few of these things. How often are they using their abilities? Look at the distance between the characters when the abilities are actually casted. What made that person use that ability? Did they wait for a specific ability to be used or did they dodge an ability while using it? Um, it literally just look, all, your, all I want you to look at is when they are using it and how they are using it. 
That's it. Just trading in the first few minutes. You don't even need to understand anything else. Just look at the trading, guys. And to improve CSing, guys, look at why you are missing CS. So it's similar to that reverse engineering uh, tactic. What you can actually do is see that you're missing a CS or go to a point where you miss CS, and then you actually go to the VOD in the OBS and you'll see, ah, oh, my eyes were actually not focused on that at all. Were you, what were you focusing on specifically? And you'll notice that maybe you were focusing on looking at your your abilities, or maybe you're focusing on the enemy and where they were, or your whatever you were focusing on, and it can really highlight why you're missing CS. Um, is it because you're not seeing which minions are actually dying? Is it because you're not um, make, prepping the minions? Is it because you don't know which one's dying first? Is it because you are attacking all the minions at the same time? Try and use the VOD to pinpoint this, and it will become very obvious when you look at it like that. Now, for a few silver-specific findings, what I've found is that they're either super aggressive, so either heavy trading all the time, not valuing CS, their attention is basically directly, all 90% of the time focused on killing the enemy, using their abilities on the enemy. Generally, you see this on champions like Echo, Syndra, Diana. This can be fixed by slowing down the lane. Direct more of that energy onto CS and just calm down. Take a chill pill, relax. You're not on some weird timer. Value your CS, guys. Or, they're very defensive, very scared, they're rarely trading, valuing CS extremely high, and not knowing when and how to trade effectively. This can be fixed by limit testing, playing more normal games, and not being afraid to int. So, this is part of the learning process, and what I've realized is a lot of silver players that are just genuinely scared to die. You have to die a lot. This is how you improve at League of Legends. I literally played... I, I, I played bot games to level 30, and when I got to level 30, I played like a thousand, I played like 500 normal games, I think, or even more, probably played a thousand normal games. I played a ridiculous amount of normal games, because I was scared. I was just scared of dying, and if I just jumped into ranked and had a lot more of an aggressive mindset, I could have been a way better player. Um, so again, that's part of the learning process. Um, what I found as well, they're very obsessed with mid-game macro when their laning has so much room for improvement. So this is the area they need to focus on. Focus on the first 5-10 minutes of the game, guys. The all I want you to be focusing on is CSing and trading. Remember, it's the 20 percenters versus the 1 percenters. The mid-game doesn't mean anything. There's no such thing as, you know, advanced macro and silver. Relax, just focusing on your laning phase, guys. The third one is that I've realized that silver players, a lot of the time, can't actually control their character. So there's a gap between what they want to do and what's actually going on with their fingers, right? So you can actually improve this with uh, LOL Dodge game and actually just playing a lot more games. Uh, this will come with time, so keep that in mind. And, may, and this is actually one of the reasons silver exists in the first place. It's a filter to know by the time you get to gold, you're going to be mechanically competent. So my advice for climbing out of silver, guys, is avoid picking complex micro champions because we know that a lot of the time a silver player just isn't comfortable with the whole keyboard mouse, clicking accuracy, controlling their character. They need to take plenty of time getting used to that. So when you pick very micro, complex micro champions, not only are you basically going to be playing that champion to like 5% capacity, it's going to make the game a lot harder and harder to learn the fundamentals. Um, just make the overall experience not fun. Avoid focusing your attention on mid to late game. First 10-15 minutes is what matters. Have a small champion pool of three simple kit, three identity, three simple identity champions. Refer to my tier list within the Discord. And avoid getting worked up about trolls and losing games because as we know, most people in silver do not care about the game. They don't care about winning or losing. They just play for fun. This is why these low elos exist. So keep in mind that the level of play will be very, very low and don't expect otherwise. Faker is not going to be in silver. Dopa is not going to be in silver, all right? So there, this rank exists for a reason. And if you win seven or six out of 10 games, you will slowly climb, guys. Five, have a constant league schedule. Because the inconsistency in you playing the game can actually limit you feeling comfortable with your champion. And as I know, and as I've seen, just straight comfortability with your champion and, you know, micro-wise, if you have a constant league schedule, you will find it easier to get comfortable in the game and actually get to gold uh, much easier. So, gold, guys. Key areas to assess and improve. Now, this is where we begin to talk about basic wave manipulation. Do they know how to slow push? Do they know how to fast push? Do they know how to hold waves, thin waves, etc.? Now, it's also important to note, 
do they know the main strengths and weaknesses of each wave state? Why is a slow push good? Like when, what does a slow push actually achieve? What does a freeze do? Why would you thin the wave? At a very basic level, I don't need to go in detail, but at a very basic level, what do the wave states actually allow you to do and the theory behind it? Basic champion identity of the three champions in their pool. So the key strengths and weaknesses, like I mentioned before, but just that little bit above, you know, so maybe what sort of trades do they thrive with? If you're playing a champion like Orianna, you want short, bursty trades. You don't want to be heavy trading. If you're playing an assassin like Echo, then probably you want to heavy trade a lot. So getting a little bit deeper in terms of the trades you want to take. The ideal game pace. So if you're playing Orianna, you want a lot slower of a game pace because you want to get to those item spikes. Whereas if you're Echo, you want probably a bit of faster game pace. How do they want to play team fights and skirmishes? Oriana wants to play front to back, very calculated behind the front line. Whereas Echo or something wants to come in from the flank or come in from the side, getting access to the back line. Very basic stuff, guys, revolving around champion identity. Nothing too special, but this stuff will really level up your game. And ideal bases, you know, we're playing someone for Oriana. What are the ideal bases? What are some items you feel strong with? Lost chapter, you want to get the lost chapter on Echo. You want to get to your, you want, maybe you want earlier bases with Dark Seal uh, Dorans, or maybe you want to get to your revolver, whatever it is. Start thinking about what are those ideal bases? What are those key item spikes? Because that didn't, that doesn't really make sense for a lot of the players in Silver, because items, it's more about like just using abilities, whereas a gold items start to come into play a little bit more. Um, then I start to look at the, the usage of trinkets and actually take warding to the next, just the next notch. Spacing out usage of wards. So not only are they using wards, but how efficiently are they using them? Are they using both trinkets at the same time, which is, you know, limiting them from, if you've actually watched my warding video, you'll know if you use both trinkets at the same time, then you're going to have a time where there's going to be no vision at all. Are they buying pinks? And when they do buy pinks, how effectively are they using them? And just trinket locations in general, rather than, than just putting them down, which is the first step for silvers in gold, you need to think a little bit more about where the location specifically, uh, where they're, they're going to be putting them. So talking about putting them on the ramp, on the raptor pit, etc. And the theory behind why warding is OP, what it actually allows you to do what sort of how that influences how you can play your wave out how that influences how aggressively you can trade so the theory behind warding makes a lot more sense because junglers are a lot more reliable in gold um but then five begin to understand how matchups should be categorized so for the key champions they'll start to realize and see the trends uh when i'm versing assassins as X champion, this is generally what I want to do. Or when I'm versing these these sorts of champions, these mages, this is generally what I want to do. I want to start to see generally general categorization of the champions, which again goes hand in hand with the basic champion identity. Six, usage of leaning and positioning in the lane for trading. Do they know, you know, how to manipulate the wave based out of standing outside the wave or inside the wave? Are they hard leaning to a specific side or even understand leaning as a concept at all? So just because they have the vision, are they utilizing it? Are they leaning to their wards? Are they abusing leaning as a concept to get better trades or minimize in a hard matchup? Leaning is a very important part of mid lane that can completely change how a lane plays out. Seven, uh, trading efficiency. Are they timing abilities with CS? So, or, they, or, they, or are they just throwing out abilities randomly without any intention? So what I found with a lot of gold players, they just, because they're starting to feel a lot more comfortable with their champion and micro-wise, they're like, oh, wow, I can start hitting all these Syndra Qs. Go, 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 go. And what I've realized is that their trading gets very, very sloppy. It's not timed with them um, the enemy trying to CS. It's not timed um, with specific things happening. It's just randomly. When they're walking backwards, they'll throw it out. They'll just throw out abilities randomly. So um, trading with intention comes into play a little bit more now in gold. And you'll notice, if you can just do that one thing, guys, actually trade with intention, timing it with the CS, your trading will drastically improve. And are they abusing cooldown differences or even understand the cooldown differences? This is, again, a massive point if you're gold, what I realize is this players, maybe they're versing something like Lux. And then Lux's cooldown on the E is insanely large. Or maybe they're versing a Vlad and Vlad uses W. And it doesn't change how they play the lane out whatsoever. And I'm thinking, okay, either you don't understand the cooldown of that ability or you're just not thinking about it at all. So when I go into a coaching session with a goal player, this is basically one of the big points is that I'm like, dude, you can literally walk up super aggressively because he just used the ability in your face. 
So again, if your gold guys go into your vaults and notice, uh, am I reacting after they use an ability, or is it changing, or is it altering how I, I use my or how I navigate my lane? Um, eight resource rationing and conservation, similar to silver, but are they being efficient with mana? You know, are they maybe using Oriana W only when necessary, or are they using Syndra E when, only when necessary? Whatever it is, um, how well are they rationing out their mana, or are they even thinking about that as a concept? Uh, and then I get a little bit more specific on itemization. So rather than just a cookie cutter build, because silver builds don't matter at all, um, you can actually start to optimize the third and second item. I don't want to go too deep in itemization, because again, it doesn't really matter too much in gold. But, um, you know, maybe this is where you can start to adapt. Oh, here I should build Zonyas instead of Banshees. Or here, be, and know the theory behind why, rather than just going on to like Mobifier or Pro Builds and be like, oh, I see uh, Huni builds this, so I'm going to build that, you know? Uh, the next one is introduction to basic roaming windows. Again, I don't really expect a gold player to understand roaming too well, because I want them, again, to just focus all on the lane. Um, but again, if there's a roaming window, they should know as a concept when it's good and bad to roam in terms of efficiency and gold and CS. So you wouldn't really want to be roaming if there's minions under your tower, um, or if the wave's not pushed out, etc. Very basic level stuff. And then basic jungle champion differences. So, for example, your, what, what does a Sejuani versus a Rek'Sai difference actually do? Or how does that impact or influence the map differently? Just really getting to start to think about jungle champion differences. So, in terms of improving how, because this is a big question I get, is how do I know how to improve my understanding of waves and how they actually interact with a champion? Do a combination of the following. The first one is, listen to your feeling of what does and doesn't feel good within a game. This will come with time, guys, and as you understand your champion more, like, like I said, champion identity, but what you'll realize is if you go into a VOD, especially the OBS point of view, you'll realize, ah... When the wave is, when I'm under tower, this feels awful. Like, I did not like this whatsoever. Or when I was pushing here, when I was actually poking them under tower, this felt really good. And then over time, you'll start to realize, okay, when I'm playing Xerath, I hate getting pushed in. Or when I'm playing uh, Syndra, I love pushing them in. And you'll realize over time, um, when it comes with champion identity, roughly what you want to be doing with waves. And again, this is very coherent with the, with the knowledge I would expect at a gold level. The next is actually assess your champion's key strengths and weaknesses. For example, is your champion uh, very sustained damage oriented like Cassiopeia or Diana, or are they very burst oriented, uh, someone like Asyndra? This will largely dictate, do you need room to chase them down or not? Okay, so if you need room to chase them down and utilize your Conqueror, then maybe you need to hold the wave on your side. Again, just very basic champion identity understanding. Level of mobility, do you have a lot of mobility? Okay, if you don't have a lot of mobility and you're an Oriana or an immobile mage, maybe you need to be a little bit more careful about how you position in the lane. You don't want to be maybe poking them too much under tower if you're versing a very uh, mobile champion because they can just chase you down, okay? So this is all going to influence your wave location. Key items and spikes, so maybe once you get lost chapter, then you can start to push. Or once you get to a certain level when you know you're strong, then you can start to push. And this is just not of you, but and the enemy. So does your enemy want sustained fights, uh, su sustained damage um, combos, or are they burst oriented? What is the level of mobility of you and the enemy? What are the key spikes of you and the enemy? This will come again with time, uh, with knowledge of the game, and this is why gold exists, because it is really a test to see how well you know the laning phase and how... It's basically a test of your knowledge of the game. And this all dictates wave position. Um, the next is hypothesize and refine, guys. If you, do if you die because you were pushing, break down why. As long as you had a theory about why it was good to push here, then you can go into your VOD and be like, okay, I thought that I could push here, but I guess I didn't consider this. Or I thought holding here was good, but... I don't think it was good because nothing really happened or I still was getting poked out. So again, start to hypothesize, come up with a theory, talk to your friends, send a message in the general chat and get people's opinions on it. So when refining your warding and leaning, guys, you can use the reverse engineering tactic to pinpoint when and where you were going wrong. So again, people ask, how do I improve my leaning or how do I know when to lean? A big tip for this one is actually go to the point where you took a bad trade or you got ganked or you had to blow flash and then be like, ah, would this have been solved? I mean, if I warded better, or would, they have been, uh, would this have been solved if I was leaning to this side? 
Or, and if, if that was the case, why didn't I use my wards? Or why wasn't I leaning? Or how could, what were the signs that actually made me, uh, would actually dictate uh, why I should lean in the first place? And you'll notice, oh, okay, I'm sitting on two vision trinkets. Oh, my vision's here, but I'm not leaning there whatsoever. And you'll start to realize that um, through this reverse engineering tactic, where you're going wrong in the lane specifically. Now, for gold-specific findings, I found that the players tend to have a decent understanding of their champion, but because it's not specific information, and it's not, and it's generally just muscle memory from playing a lot of that champion, they have a hard time replicating ways to get leads, and this goes hand in hand with their little understanding of waves, because waves and champion identity allows replication of leads. If you don't understand how waves lead to favorable trades or champion identity, how that leads to favorable trades, you're not going to be able to replicate it. So this is why the infamous ELO hell exists for a lot of gold players and the Christmas light match histories, right? And this is where most people tilt in this rank all the time. And I get messages on Discord. Oh, look at my, you know, uh, look what I did here this game. I lost, look at my teammates and all this stuff. It's because they have a hard time replicating winning lane or replicating things happening because they don't understand the, how the waves work, okay? So... Very big, big thing here, guys. And they tend to emphasize mid-game and skim over laning phase. They always complain that they win lane, but winning lane is so broad. Like, gold players would benefit from getting into the details of the laning phase rather than focusing on macro. So yes, maybe you got some, maybe you got some one kill. Okay, tell me how you can replicate that next time. What did you do that specifically that brought about that kill? Great, you got the kill. That's a great step, but... What happened the next game? Didn't you lose lane that game? Or is, if you were winning and going 3-0 and and out of laning phase every single game, you would not be in gold. Because that would tell me that you know how to replicate getting leads, guys. So um, they tend to emphasize mid-game way too much. And again, the laning phase should be first 10 minutes is where they should be directing all of their attention. Um, because they have the mechanical part of the game down, so they feel very comfortable with the micro, because in silver they don't really feel comfortable with the micro, they tend to overlook all the small details, and they just want the secret to climbing. They feel like, I know everything about my champion, I, I know how to kill people, and they just want the secret, what am I doing wrong? Is there some mid-game macro strategy? How can I do this? There's no secret, it's just all the small details. The difference between a gold and a master tier or a challenger player, it's all the small details that they are consistently doing every single laning phase that allow them to generate leads or minimize poor matchups. So it's all the small details, guys, that add up. And they worry way too much about itemization and runes. You can literally take the most suboptimal runes and suboptimal <laughs> uh, itemization and still climb out of gold, okay? Itemization and runes are just like, it's, it's honestly a one percenter. That stuff really comes into play platinum and above. Um, so my advice for climbing out of gold is you need to spend time watching over at least the first seven to ten minutes of your laning phase. So you can begin to see all the little ways to optimize and reliably generate leads. A great way to do this is use the reverse engineering method, but instead of looking at mistakes, look for the things that led to that kill. So great, you got a kill. What did you do specifically that led to that kill? T tell me what happened. Ah, oh, so you did you pull the wave here? Did you have the wave in a great location? Did you build a wave? Did you bounce the wave off the tower to have it pushing back to you? Um, did you lean onto this side of your vision, which allowed you to play very aggressively? What did you do specifically um, that allowed you to get a lead? Or maybe it was even as simple as I just timed my Q poke whenever they walked up to CS. If you literally do that, I guarantee you you'll win 80% of your laning phases. Um, and sometimes, guys, escaping gold really requires seeing trends. Take time to watch multiple VODs and notice trends of why are you getting ahead and why are you getting behind. Generally, you'll notice things like this. Either you're dying to ganks often, which could be either a lack of wave location understanding or warding problem, or you're blowing flash often in lane, maybe due to wave position or again or warding problem. Getting forced out of lane a lot due to poor trading or poor no mana conservation or your resource conservation, uh, which is, again, this one, always being oom um in lane or always feeling scared. And again, feeling is a big one. This is an indicator or indication that you are doing something wrong. Listen to your feeling within the laning phase, guys. Platinum, okay, key areas to assess and improve. Now, this is where the game gets a lot more complex, um, and this is where a lot of people do get stuck, actually. So... If you are Platinum or even, you know, Diamond, there's probably a lot of things within this one that you have no idea about and you're not looking at whatsoever. 
So laning details need to be hardcore refined. Okay, this is where laning needs to get very, very detailed. Are you looking, are you staying in lane for the optimal amount of gold, tying it to item spike and level spike? So are you staying in, are you staying in lane too long? Uh, maybe you're Echo and you're staying in, gold, in lane for like 1300 gold, or maybe you're playing uh, Oriana, but you're always basing like three, 400 gold all the time. Like you need to be assessing, are you staying in lane for the optimal amount of gold? Are you positioning aggressively or defensively, defensively enough in lane? So again, this ties to abusing cooldown advantages and range advantages. So if you are, if you're playing a champion like Oriana into, what's a low range champion? Oriana into Fizz and you're getting pushed in level one or two, or you haven't got a single bit of poke off, and maybe you're positioning behind your creeps, but you're not even thinking about the wave, then maybe you're just not, you're not thinking at all about your range advantage, or you're not thinking at all about your, you're not abusing your cooldown advantage. So positioning in lane is very, very important to assess. Are you taking trades that are coherent with your champion's identity? Do you want, are you heavy trading when you should be, or are you taking short bursty trades when you should be? Again, tying to champion identity. Are you timing trades with mana flow band when the enemy walks off a CS? Do you understand how to minimize poor matchups? When you're in a poor matchup, you don't want to be heavy trading all the time. You want to be minimizing, abusing your range advantage, or you know, doing things to minimize. You don't want to be playing into the strengths of the enemy champion. Um, do you know how to abuse favorable matchups? Are you manipulating the wave with intention, or are you just autopiloting? Do you know what wave positions are actually good for your champion? Do you need room to all in, or do you not want room to all in? What does your champion? What sort of trades does your champion? want to take and how is that influencing the wave location? Are you leaning to your vision or are you leaning without any vision? Are you taking the optimal runes summoners builds given the pace of the lane? Are you taking a scaling rune as Echo um, when you're in a very early spiking matchup like Echo versus Zed? You know, like you need to be thinking about is your runes, summoners and builds, does it make sense with the matchup that you're specifically playing? Um, two, teammate and enemy awareness now has to be improved to a decent level. So I'm looking for some of these bad habits. Trading heavy when the jungle is in base. Trading heavy when the jungle is ganking a side lane. Leaning onto the wrong side. So maybe, um, you know, your jungle is actually ganking bot lane, but you're, then you're leaning top side off the wave. No, you should be leaning to the side your jungler is to back them up if an extended fight occurs. You're not uh, training heavy enough when your jungler's in the area. You're not playing, you're playing without consideration of, of your vision. So you're just playing your lane as if it's a 1v1 and not using vision at all. Um, roaming to a side or doing aggressive moves when people are resetting. This is again where, how people get picked off a lot. Uh, resetting when your team is doing in a dragon or an objective. So your team's about to do an objective, but you just recall. Um, again, all those things, all these things come down to teammate and, and, and your enemy awareness. So one thing I always look at when I see platinum players is that I'm surprised a lot of the time at how little awareness they are of where everyone is on the map. And I'm always thinking like, okay, okay if we just pause the VOD here, guys, and like uh, as if I'm talking to the platinum player, I'll say, pause the VOD here. Did you have any idea, when, before you went for this trade, did you have any idea where your jungle was? And a lot of the time, the answer is no. So Platinum is more about laning in consideration with the information you have on the map, okay? Um, basic roaming fundamentals. So rather than just playing for poke and plates, this is where we need to start identifying the side to lean to and start to understand which uh, where we want to roam. Okay, which side we want to roam towards. So the basic roaming fundamentals really come into play in Platinum. Um, four, how often are they assessing the side lane situation? Are they aware at all of which side is winning? How many times are they actually pressing tab to update that information? And are they even using F keys at all or panning the camera at all? Do they know? Uh, if I pause the VOD, I'll literally ask them. Okay, here, did you know? Or if you watch your VOD, it, you ask yourself, did I know bot was winning? If you say no, then that's a big problem. That's ringing alarm bells for me, saying that okay, we need to we need to get you looking at the minimap more, or we need to get you pressing tab more to get that information processing. And maybe you're not actually comfortable doing that yet, which is completely fine. And this is what platinum is for. Platinum is for making sure because gold, you start to get more about the champion identity. Platinum, your champion identity and your laning has to be so muscle memory because now platinum, you have to start thinking about more macro elements. So by the time you go from platinum four to diamond, 
the 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 laning should be just muscle memory and you should have all the the mental the, the mental capacity to think about start to think about what else is going on in the map this is what platinum's actually for which well, is my take on it anyway um deeper analysis on skirmish and team fighting so i'm looking for are they generating threat by holding abilities are they rushing and panicking in key moments so this might tell me if they're panicking that they don't really have champion mastery are they able to identify where their champion thrives so does their cha do they know that their champion thrives in river fights or in lane around objectives do they want to flank etc are they able to identify and adapt to key enemy threats so do they know who on the enemy team actually threatens them and are they even processing this uh, and use uh, the VOD to actually ask yourself this. So when you go into a VOD, I want you to ask yourself, okay, here, did I know that this guy could just one-shot me? Or why was I positioning here if I knew if I, if I I knew that this guy could just kill me like this? Or, and you'll realize a lot of the time you haven't thought about at all how you could die in this fight. So if you're versing, for example, a Diana who wants to flank, a lot of the time I noticed my, the client will say, um, they'll just die to this Diana flank. I'm like, it's, I mean, for me, I'm always thinking who's threatening me. And you'll realize if they're not thinking about that, they will allow themselves to get flanked. They'll allow themselves to just get bursted in fights. You'll notice that this is a big hole in their gameplay. Six is basic mid game macro. Do they understand what their champion actually wants to do in mid game? Um, do they want to push and move? Do they want to group and pick? Do they want to group and force? Do they want to sideline and TP? So again, this is where basic mid-game macro really comes into play. Now for improving these key areas, guys. So the first one is, this is where watching high ELO players play that specific champion becomes very helpful. And specifically, I'm going to give you a tip to actually utilize watching a VOD of someone else play, is actually pause the VOD when they're at a key moment, or even if it's just randomly in the laning phase, and ask yourself, okay, what would I do in this situation? And then I would come up with what I would do, and then I would play the VOD and, and, be, and then play it out and actually assess, oh, they made this decision? You know what, I probably wouldn't have done that. And I would start to break down why they made the decision, was it even good, was it correct, who was correct, and really get into the nitty gritty because this is how you can really improve your laning phase and see, oh, why are they pushing and moving? Why are they doing this? Um, you'll start to realize things over time by doing this strategy. Um, the next one is you need to play devil's advocate with your laning. So ask yourself the following questions. Did this lane pace feel good for the game I want to play? So when you're watching your VOD in your laning phase, maybe you're playing Oriana, but you're like just heavy trading all the time. You're having to blow flash because of it. Maybe you're having to base often. And you, can, you should ask yourself, does this even feel good for me? Could I have actually just slowed down this laning phase? Or was it appropriate given what was happening in the game? Start to ask yourself that question. Could I have abused my X advantage in this laning phase? So could I have abused your range advantage? Could I have abused my cooldown advantage? Could I have abused my early spike in my damage? Really get into, ask, uh, get into the nitty gritty. Could I have positioned more aggressively in this lane? Why was I standing behind the minions here? Could I have actually been positioning way more aggressively in the lane? Could I have positioned aggressively given I have the vision or did you not have the vision? Really ask yourself, your, uh, try and criticize your positioning within the lane. Why were you scared in this moment? This is a big one, okay? What I realize is that a lot of players, when they play and watch their VODs, they, they'll realize, oh, I felt really scared here. But they don't, they just accept it. They, they, they get this feeling, but they just accept it. And this is actually, I just want to quickly riff on this. One of the pro players that I used to, um, Shurnfire, he was, I respected him big time for this. Because what he would do, he would go to a VOD, and then he would be like, why was I, why did I feel so scared here? Why, why did I feel so awkward in this moment? And rather than just accepting it as, as that the way it was, he would, he would ask questions then, how can I prevent this from happening? What could I have done to prevent this feeling? Or was could I go back in time and prevent this feeling from occurring in the first place or these specific things happening? So he, he used the feeling or feeling scared or threatened or whatever it was to find creative ways or ways to navigate that situation better. Um, could I have avoided this gank if I lent to this side? So again, go to a gank. If you lent better, could you have avoided it? And how could you actually see that in the future? Maybe this ties to were you using your vision trinkets? Or how do you even know which side was um, 
could you have leaned to? Because a lot of the time you can say in theory, oh yeah, I should have leaned bot side. But if there's no sign that told you you should lean to bot side, maybe that's a sign telling you I shouldn't be pushing at all. <laughs> maybe that's a sign saying, Curtis, okay, right now, yes, I could have survived if I was leaning, but I have no information. How do I know where to lean in the first place? Okay, yes, I probably should have let them get push on me on this wave. Okay, so it's a really good uh, way of kind of reverse engineering a solution as well. And the next one is push the VOD and ask yourself, was I aware of what was happening in the side lane at this time? Or was I aware of my jungle's location at this time? So big one, guys. Re I can't emphasize this enough. If you're a platinum player, and again, this is probably the case with a lot of diamond players as well, pause the VOD and literally just quickly ask yourself, did I know what was happening in the side lane here? Did I know they were heavy trading all the time? Did I know my jungle was in base? Did I know my jungle was no HP full clearing on Krugs? And you'll realize how, how poor your awareness of teammates actually are. And again, this is what Platinum is for. Platinum really is for getting your, your mind away from just the laning phase to all of these other aspects of the game. And teammate and enemy awareness are massive. Because if you don't have teammate and enemy awareness, you're not going to be able to know what to do with your wave. You're not going to be able to know what the optimal macro roam decision is. And this is why roaming is really just kind of touched on in Platinum and gets really... kind of comes into play mainly in Diamond, though. And, yeah, this will actually lead you to finding what was what is muscle memory as well. That's another good point. So... Um, one thing I've realized is that players can't begin to think about teammate awareness or where their teammates are if they are not comfortable with a specific champion. So this is why I say play the same three or four champions and, and go for a champion mastery because that's going to free up the mental capacity to begin thinking about teammate locations and enemy locations. So if you don't feel comfortable doing that, it's okay. Take your time. Realize that this is a long-term process and the more comfortable you feel with your laning and your trading and your wave location, things like awareness will come with time. So some platinum specific findings, guys. Generally, this is the rank where the game starts to get a lot more complex and you can't just afford to go autopilot. You need to be playing with intention and constantly coming into games with theories on the way you want to play out the lane. So you should have a theory on the, of the, the quality of the, the type of the lane pace, where you want wave locations, how aggressive you can posture in the lane, what the trading patterns might be given the cooldown differences, range differences, and just overall base stats and scaling. So that's actually very, very important. So attention, coming up with theories, um, a great way to level up your game in Platinum. And now that you start to realize how complex the game is, it can become a little overwhelming. So... This is where people start to try and find little ways to improve to Diamond. They start to use third-party programs, these weird analytics stuff. They start to think about overcomplicate their champion pool. There's no need to do any of this, guys, all right? So what I recommend is just, and for my advice for climbing out of Platinum is, you need to remember why you played the game and bring it back to fun. Stop overcomplicating it. Take your time and relax. It isn't a race. Stop trying to find shortcuts with flavor of the month champions and weird MMR tricks and all of this nonsense. Just play the game. Platinum is a test. And it's a test to see how comfort comfortable, what is mu muscle memory, what isn't muscle memory, how comfortable you are with your laning phase, how much information can you process. If I just put you, a gold player who just got to Platinum, put them into a master tier game, they're going to be overwhelmed. They're not going to be able to process all that information. Okay? And like I said here, Platinum to Diamond is a test to see, to see if you really understand the specifics of the game, or maybe you just got lucky with your champion in gold. Put aside your ego, focus on the specifics, forget, and people actually forget that LP is the byproduct of knowing how to replicate a winning lane. So if you know the specifics of how to replicate winning your lane through wave management, all of these things, leaning, etc., you will naturally win lane a lot of the time and you will get LP. That's just how it works. And I've actually found that Platinum players are so scared of Diamond players and they check OPGG before the game more than any other rank. And then they just they just start to get anxious or overcomplicate things. Calm down. Stop doing this, please. And bring your attention back to the matchup you are playing specifically, okay? So I don't care if you're a Platinum 2 player versus a Diamond 3. I don't care if you're a Platinum 4 versus a Diamond 4. It really does not matter. I want you to focus on the matchup. How are you going to navigate that matchup? 
What are your hypotheses heading into the game, okay? How do you think your matchup's going to get played out? Um, really stop doing that, and it's going to massively influence your, uh, your, the reason why you're not climbing. Now for diamond guys, and this is where things start to get very, very juicy, um, and yeah, it's going to be quite complicated, guys, so strap yourself in. Number one, guys, and this is for the climb from diamond to master tier. For, so for a lot of people, uh, there, there's going to be a lot of things in here that you're not doing as well, so keep that in mind. First one I tried to look for is just straight up jungle understanding and accuracy of jungle knowledge. This is where we need to assess the player's ability to assess and adapt to jungle pathing differences and see if they can actively keep up with the jungle state throughout the game. So given their knowledge on the jungler's path or given the differences in the jungle strength, given um, literally how the game's playing out from the jungle's perspective, how should they be adapting their, the way they're playing their lane? Given their wave location, the quality of the trades, etc. Are they going to contest scuttles? All these things you should starting to think about and how how good is their knowledge, okay? So refer to my jungle tracking video if you want a little bit more information on this, but this is what really becomes important in Diamond because it's less about the lane now because the lane's just, you, have, you should have all that information from Platinum. This is where the juicy details about all the other things outside of lane really come into play if you want to get to Master Tier. Two. How well they are translating leads they generate in lane. So I'm actually looking for tempo assessment, tempo creation, opportunity creation overall. So are they setting up the way for ganks? Are they are they manipulating the way for roams? Are they manipulating the way for invades? So are they slow pushing, etc.? And just straight up understanding of tempo as a concept. Tempo is incredibly important as a mid laner. Diamond to master tier, this is where it really comes into play, especially high diamond. Are they thinking about what the next play is outside of their lane given the map state? So again, using that information that they're now able to or should be theoretically processing, um, they should be thinking about, okay, how, what should I be doing in my lane to complement the next play? Should I, and so this is things like the jungle strength, um, what dragons are up, the rift tower is it up, side lane strength, what are the quality of the trades actually happening in the side lanes, who can actually carry, all of this information should now be dictating and running through your mind what is the next play. So maybe your bot lane's getting a lot of pressure and taking very good trades, that should be sending a signal to you saying, okay, I can actually slow push a wave and maybe dive bot, or maybe I can slow build a wave and call for a dragon, or maybe I can go for an invade with my jungle because my jungle is stronger than the enemy jungler. Whatever it is, you're using information from all these different roles to dictate your next move. This is where side lane awareness needs to be assessed. So how often are you actually panning your camera? Are you not panning your camera at all? How up to date is your knowledge of what's happening in the side lanes? Okay, so F keys or just using your camera to pan or whatever it is, uh, how often are you pan using, how often are you staying up to date with the information in the side lanes, and are they even aware of what's happening in the side lanes? A lot of the time I watch like a diamond player and they literally have no idea that their top's gonna get dived or their bot lane is losing or whatever it is, they have no idea. Um, and they should be knowing, they should know how this knowledge interacts with their lane to change and dictate their next move, like I said before. So number three, given all the information, are they adapting the pace they are playing their lane? Now, what I mean by this is if the game, maybe your bot's heavy trading, your jungler's an aggressive jungler, maybe graves into Zack and is really far ahead and wants to start dragons or dive bot or whatever it is, are you adapting the way you're playing the your lane? Uh, based off this information. So again, maybe you are playing Syndra and you can actually play the wave and the lane a lot of differing ways. You can play it super heavy trading, go, go, go. You can, you know, take a chill pill, relax, play to your GLP, whatever it is. What I should be, what I'm looking for in a VOD is, are they changing the pace or are they at least altering their pace um, to complement what's happening overall in the game? Um, when are they basing in the lane? So you don't really want to be basing when your jungle is invading. You don't want to be basing when they're starting objectives, etc. Um, are they using this inf information to adapt how they play the waves? So again, if your jungle is a Rek'Sai and is really far ahead, you have two options. Are they? A, uh, are you? Do you want to pull the wave and set up a gank? Do you want to push and back him up for invades and dives? What do you want to do? And are you at least? thinking about how you should have adapt or play your ways or come up with a hypo are you coming up with a hypothesis to find a way to complement what else is happening on the map um, how often and where they actually roam on the map so this one's a big one so given the information that you're seeing from the jungler and the side lanes 
Um, how often are you roaming and where are you actually roaming? Are you roaming to the right side lane? Are you not roaming at all? Are you playing for the lane when you should, you should be playing for push and move? This is things that I really start to look at. And this one, this point here, you can generally tell how often, even if I don't even look at the OBS VOD, even if I just look at the league for replay, I can tell how often and how up to date a player's side lane awareness is by the way they play the lane, because you'll notice that, that like the jungler is doing all these side lane ganks and all these things, and they're still like freezing or they're holding the waves or they're playing the lane really slow, and they're just not roaming at all. I could just tell you straight away that they're not assessing the side lanes at all. So it's um it's very very obvious when you when you look at your own vod. Uh, micro optimization. So in diamond, you should be th thinking about things like chaining CC, weaving in auto attacks, generation of threat by holding abilities, and just using abilities in certain ways. This is like the champ mastery test. So um, again, when you're diamond, you can't afford to be sloppy with the way you play your champion. Champion mastery really comes into play, and you should be paying attention to detail. Um, the next is begin awareness and tracking of flash timers and how that actually influences decisions within the game. Massive one. Big, big, big one. So you should be tracking at least flash timers, at least in your own lane. If you can't do other lanes, it's, I mean, it is something I urge you to do, but um, flash timers are absolutely massive. And not just the tracking, but how the, there's two steps to it. So there's the tracking element, and then there's the, how that lack of flash changes your behavior. So it's not good enough just to track it. You've got to process, process that information because that literally determines what you do, what your next move is. So for example, you're playing Rumble and your bot lane has the enemy bot lanes playing Ash with no flash. That should be ringing alarm bells in your mind saying, you know what? I can guarantee that I can kill bot lane now because is it a mobile AD carry with no flash? That should influence how you play the lane. Maybe you should slow build a wave out push a wave when your jungler's coming out of base to dive bot, whatever it is. So uh, awareness of flash timers and how that actually influences decisions are incredibly big. Um, and also, if you blow flash mid 1v1 and time the flash, you shouldn't just be pushing all the time. Maybe you should bounce the wave, hold it on your side and generate a, gank, a gank, you know, that sort of thing. Um, how are they adapting? Uh, uh, sorry, are they adapting how they play the lane based off rune choices and summoner choices? So again, if you have TP advantage, versus Ignite or whatever it is, that should adapt or should change the way you play the lane. Conversely, if someone takes a scaling rune and you have like more of a laning rune, maybe you're taking Airy versus like Dark Harvest or whatever it is, that should also influence the way or the pace you play the lane. Um, optimization of ward timing, ward locations, given knowledge of jungle tracking and where pressure needs to be generated on the map. So what I mean by this is again, in Diamond, jungle tracking should be something that's quite quite easy for you to do. You should be at least quite confident on jungle tracking. So, given your knowledge on jungle tracking, how can you optimize the usage of your wards in terms of timing, in terms of location, but more importantly, given your knowledge of uh, the, the jungle location, maybe you see your bot lanes actually winning, maybe you should actually use your wards on the bot side um, to actually give your bot lane more room to push and play aggressively. So actually using information on side lanes to not only help you, but help your side lanes as well with wards. Very, very important. Eight, are they optimizing their pick in draft or even have a diversified pool in general? Because picking the right champ in terms of damage spread, pace of the game, micro synergy start to become very useful in diamond. You can get away with it up until diamond, um, but you know, as soon as you get to diamond, this is where having a diversified pool is very important. Are they beginning to call plays on or off? Now, this is a big one. So if you're playing Rumble, for example, given their champion identity, you know you're very ultimate reliant. If there's a 50-50 dragon fight and you're not sure if you're going to win it or lose it, you should be assessing the play and tell yourself an age, like a minute in advance, I'm not going to have ultimate for this. I should call it off. We should make that trade. So I'm looking for when I'm looking at a diamond player, how well do they know their champion's identity? And are they making macro calls or macro decisions um, that are based off their champion's identity? 10, are they actively able to adapt within a game given who is fed and not fed to change how they position in team fights, who they target in team fights, how they need to build to alter, how they need to alter builds to generate more threats, sorry, where on the map they thrive in fights, the level of risk necessary when determining whether a player is valuable or not, and who has shutdowns and how that dictates decisions. Now, let's get into the details of these ones because these are all very important. The first one, how they position in team fights. So, 
what I mean here is, if you're playing Casio, for example, or no, let's say another champion. Let's just say you're playing. Let's say you're playing Echo. Okay, and let's just say you have a very fed AD carry. You can actually play Echo two ways. You can actually play Peel Echo in a sense and play for your AD carry. And again, this is something that you may not do often, but in the rare case you have a very fed Aphelios or something, there's no need for you to risk diving the back line when you could potentially even just play front to back and win the fight and peel for your AD carry. So are they able to adapt based off who is fed on the enemy team or who is fed on your team and who's not fed the way they play fights and how they position in fights? Um, who they target in team fights. So, um, if someone is specifically fed on the enemy team with no flash, maybe that's someone they should be looking to target, etc. Uh, so this is always more information, processing more information. How they do, um, how they need to alter builds. So maybe they see their enemy AD carry getting very fed in the early game. So maybe before a dragon fight, instead of going for the fiendish codex part of the Zonias first, they go for the um, the Seeker's arm guard. Sorry. So. Again, thinking about itemization and how that can help you generate more threat in general. And more importantly, maybe you're versing a Fizz and there's a big fight coming up. You should be thinking, oh, if I just get a stopwatch this fight, we can win this fight. You know, something like that. Um, where in the map they thrive in fights, like I said before, are they playing uh, Rumble and Oriana? They want to play choke points or they want to play in the open with um, Ziggs or whatever it is. You know, they thinking about where on the map they want to fight. Uh, the level of risk necessary when... Okay, so this one's a big one. Level of risk. So, if your team is behind, and you, maybe you know your team doesn't scale too often, and this is in terms of adaption, you know um, the enemy AD carry is fed, you're not scaling too well, you're playing Pantheon mid, whatever. You probably know if it fights... If a play is 50-50 and you're really not sure, you probably should go for that play. But if you know that you're scaling really well, it's a risky play, you have a shutdown, you don't really know, you don't need to do that play. I actually err on, I, I err on the side of caution and con, like a, con, is a conservation or being conservative, sorry. So again, this will come with time, but are you able to adapt given your assessment of who's strong, who's fed scaling uh, in terms of like the risk of the play and if it's worth making that play as a, as a concept? Um, and who has shutdowns? Because if someone has a shutdown, maybe it's worth trading one for one with someone because this will, again, dictate your decisions. 11. In mid and late game, are they able to adapt to the following? The amount of engage on the enemy team. So, and both teams, sorry. So, maybe you're a champion that can both be in the side lane and group. If this is the case, maybe you should be thinking about the level of mobility because this will determine, oh, if they have a lot of engage, I probably can't afford to go to the side lane because my team's just going to get engaged on. Or maybe the enemy has no mobility and we have a lot of engage. So if I just group, we can just die them or ace them. You know, that sort of thing. Um, the strength in the side lane relative to their opponents, are they able to identify that they uh, are stronger than their opponent in the side lane and how strong they actually are? Uh, make the right decision on where to be given teammate location and tendencies of teammates. Okay, big, big, big one. And no one talks about this actually. Okay, so... Think about a game where it's really close. 35 minute brawl. This is just messy, dirty, 35 minutes. Um, and you're really unsure whether or not you could be in the side lane or not. Based off your assessment and judgment of what has happened in that game so far. So maybe you'll, you'll notice that every single time I go to the side lane, they get engaged on. Or I've noticed my AD carry is always out of position. Based off of your experience in that game so far and the tendencies you've seen of your teammates, that is sometimes that actually influences how you should play out macro-wise in mid to late game. So maybe you weren't sure whether you should be in the, the side lane or not. If you know that your AD carry has been picked the whole game, maybe he's a little tilted, you should probably just group, okay? And this, again, will come with time and experience. And it is a big, uh, a big, uh, a big thing, a big area of focus you could look at in your reviews to ask yourself... What were the signs here that told that would tell me that I should group over splitting? Very big one. And just overall teammate location, where you can be in the side lane, etc. Um, 12, maintain focus despite getting behind. To find creative ways using champion identity to get a win regardless. Again, um, just because you get behind in the early game, may, maybe that was your area of focus in Platinum, where getting behind is, is really, really important. But in Diamond, you should have that level of champion mastery where even if you die, you should know how to navigate the game from behind because someone else can carry you. So losing gracefully 
I, I did touch on that that specific topic or concept in one of my previous videos in the game plans video, but losing gracefully and understanding how to minimize on your champion and stay focused regardless is important climbing from diamond to master tier. Um, have a basic understanding of micro interactions on a 2v2, 3v3 level. So again, what are some of those micro interactions? So if you're playing, um, uh, you know, Gragas Yasuo, understanding all the, like the, the natural synergies within that, or maybe you're playing Braum, you've got a Braum support and you're playing Lucian mid, like understanding that in a 3v3 bot, you're actually going to have a lot more threat because of those micro interactions. Just basic understanding of micro interactions, but that's more of like a master tier plus thing. So in terms of improving these things, this is where intense VOD review really comes into play. You can't afford to skim over things. The attention to detail is crucial. So ask yourself the following questions. How could I have complemented my winning side better? Whether it's through roaming, hovering, trinket usage, control world usage, tempo bases, etc. How could you have complemented your winning side better? Massive question, guys. Were the roams that I, I did, were they even effective? And how else could I have used my priority or my move? So you'll find that just because you roam, there were a lot of there were a lot of places you could have roamed. You could have roamed top, bot, jungle. There were a lot of things that you could have done. So were the roams that you actually did even effect, effective? Did you hover? Did it even change anything? Or did you roam? Did it, was there even kill threat? So how good were your roams? You don't just say, oh yeah, I roamed heaps this game. What did you get done with those roams? Were they even effective? Was the way I played the lane even correct, given the pace of the game? And, and how the jungle side lanes were actually playing out. So what I mean by this is, was I playing this lane too slow? Or too fast given what was happening in the side lane so if my side lane was always heavy trading or my top lane was already always heavy trading and I had the option of playing this lane quite fast maybe I should have you know maybe I should I, maybe I, maybe I just didn't identify that they were playing heavy trading and maybe I didn't identify that they were playing the lane really fast so I could have played the lane faster but I didn't so I'll look at the lane and be like Maybe I should have just played for trade heavy and create opportunity for my jungler. Or maybe I should have played to trade heavy, base early for tempo so I could roam bot or whatever it was. So think about the way you played the lane in terms of pace. Could I have called for an early objective of invades or dives? Okay, a big one. So if you got a lot of early priority, could you have called for an early gank? Could you have called for an early invade on the second red buff? Whatever it was. Did you time summoners? And if not, why didn't you do it? Was your rune choice and build path optimal given the matchup and the champions in the game? Again, that is something that you should look at in hindsight that can really level up your game. Because maybe you're like, oh, I actually barely procced area this game. Or I barely procced comment. I should have just taken phase rush. So then you'll realize, oh, okay, in these matchups, we're in this jungle matchup. I should probably just go phase rush because it scales much better and I'm not going to utilize comment too much. Um, why was I low in this portion of the lane? Big one. Okay, big, big one. What I recommend is when you're looking at your VODs in Diamond, don't just accept that you took a bad trade, okay? Or don't just accept that, oh, I couldn't go to that fight because I was too low. Why were you low? Very big. If there's a scuttle fight and you're like sitting under tower with low HP, why were you low in the first place? Absolute game changer. Don't blame the jungler for dying on scuttle. Blame yourself for being low in that situation that you couldn't back them up. In an instance, so it's like kind of like taking responsibility and always find, always bring it back onto you. Did hovering at this time even change how the side lane plays out? So maybe the enemy champions in bot lane are not threatened by your roam at all. So you're hovering, you're thinking that you're doing a good job by hovering, but in reality, it doesn't do anything. You're playing Oriana, they're playing Zyra Khan. They don't give a crap about your your hover. So maybe that's a sign that instead of hovering, you should get plates or poke them under tower. So think about the, what are you getting out of your hovering in general? And could you have actually used your ultimate creatively in lane to push them out to guarantee a tempo reset or a tempo roam or start an objective? Sometimes people sit in lane as Oriana and never use their ultimate. Or they're playing Rumble and they never use their ultimate. You know, just putting it out there, you could have maybe used your ultimate, blow it in the early game, or you're playing Syndra, just ult them, chunk them out of lane, guarantee you get shove on the wave, get a tempo reset, that's going to allow you to start an early objective, do a roam, play, dive sides, whatever. Could you have generated more threat by swapping to Red Trinket? Could you have swapped to Red Trinket, which actually 
um, increased or heightened the level of threat on your hovers or roams? Could you have sacrificed HP on a wave to guarantee push to contest that early scuttle? And if so, how can I know a fight would break out? So, um, based off your jungle tracking knowledge and your jungle pathing knowledge and just jungle strength overall, could you have actually sacrificed HP or heavy traded here to guarantee that you would get to that fight first? Again, this is a hindsight thing and it will refine over time. But what you'll realize is, oh, when it's like Elise Rex side jungle matchup and they both start bot side, which you can easily tell by who leashes, maybe I should actually not get pushed in because I know most likely there's going to be a fight on top scuttle. So if I like... Maybe I have to sacrifice and use one or two of my corrupting pots, but I can guarantee that I'll get to that fight first, and then that will allow my jungler to get double scuttle or whatever it is. Could you have communicated in game to give direction on your team and what the next play was? A lot of the time, a simple a simple thing saying, "Give this dragon, we go top, we get top tower," or "We fight, we win this dragon fight," or say, "Get everyone get here," or "Everyone base now for dragon." Like even just a simple call can really give your team direction to stop them from feeling ho uh, helpless. Uh, were you aware of the way the side lane was playing out the way it did? And were you hypothesizing it to play out like that? And this is massive. When you're, like in my gameplay and video, I talk about when you're in champ select or when you're in the loading screen, you should be t uh, telling yourself what you think, how you think the lane is actually going to play out. So what I mean by that is, if you see a specific top matchup, you should be thinking to yourself, how do I think that lane's going to play out? Who do I think wins it and why? And how? what are the quality of the trades? Like, who has kill threat? What's the gank setup like? What are the quality of the trades going on in that lane? So what you should be doing is after you watch your VOD, you'll realize, oh, I didn't expect that lane to go like that whatsoever. I thought Malphite wins this matchup or whatever it is. So um, this can really help you level up your game knowledge because... Once you get to Master Tier Plus, your game knowledge about matchups in every role needs to be on point. Was my hypothesis about the way the jungle matchup played out accurately? Again, something you can look at in hindsight. And in terms of improving these areas, the second point is, this is where watching high elo players play the champs become very helpful. Same as Platinum guys. Use the same tip where you pause the VOD, ask yourself, what would you do in this situation? Exact same tip as before. Um, three, if you're struggling to process information about the map, break it down and pick one thing you want to think about more. So maybe a little overwhelmed so far and you're thinking, oh my God, how can I improve all these, these things? Literally start with a jungle. I, I always recommend start with a jungle. In your review, focus all your attention on how could I have been more aware of my jungle's location? You could have do you could do it multiple ways. You could use lull states in the lane to think about your jungle's location and to press tab when you're in those little lull states where you're not trading in lane to see their items and their assess the relative strength. You can use the times where you're actually recalled coming out of a base to assess jungle information. Um, and rather than paying attention just to the enemy jungler, take the time to actually think about your own jungler's location and how strong they are as well. So don't get overwhelmed thinking, oh my god, I can't think about bot, top, jungle. Like, yes, this will come with time again. Maybe it's a sign that you're not comfortable enough in your laning phase. Maybe it's a sign that you don't understand your matchups well enough. Maybe it's a sign that... Um, it could be a sign of so many differing things. What I recommend is pick one thing you want to focus on more. Whether it's, again, jungle location, what, how your bot lane's trading, how your top lane's trading. Whatever it is, pick one thing and improve on it. Focus on it. So some diamond specific findings. They tend to be the most stuck from diamond to master. They're the most stuck and they complain a lot about jungle difference and bot lane difference. This is because they have no idea how to influence these two roles and how the, the way they play their lane actually um, influences and the actions they do influence everything else on the map. Because mid lane is the center of the map, guys. And it's all the small things that massively dictate what happens in the side lanes and in your jungle matchup. And I can't wait for the comments. I'm going to get comments saying, oh, Curtis, you would know I win this game. They send me a screenshot where like their bot lane goes AFK at like five minutes. Or they show me a screenshot where their bot lane's like 0-10. Yes, those games will happen, guys. I'm not saying every game's winnable. It will happen. But a lot of the time, I guarantee you, you're not optimizing your warding. You're not 
leaning to the side your jungler is. You're not complimenting your jungler at all. You're not hovering in between waves. You're not understanding how to generate threat in the side lane. You're not understanding, you're not seeing opportunities to dive the side. You're not, you're missing opportunities to roam onto the side lanes. You're not calling off objectives that are not good for your team. There is literally hundreds of ways to influence your jungler and your bot lane. And you, and they have, diamond players generally have no idea. And this is why they say jungle difference or bot lane difference. And yes, guys, again, to reiterate one more time, there will be games that aren't winnable, blah, 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 just to say it so you guys don't get butt hurt. Um, but I'm sick of saying that, honestly. I'm, I'm like, you guys, I'm going to say it again and again. I'm not going to stop saying it, actually. Even though I'm sick of saying it, I'm not going to stop saying it because if you're Diamond wanting to go Master Tier, you need to understand how important and how all the small details influence everyone else on the map. So the best way to overcome this is literally to shift your focus from just winning lane to winning lane and translating leads. Diamond is the, the, the elo where it's all about translating leads. It's all about the map, guys. Cool. You know how to great you know how to replicate getting leads in lane. Brilliant. You know how to play your champion really well. Brilliant. Now let's take it to the next level. Let's talk about translating leads with all those questions that I've talked about before. And you won't improve at this skill if you say things like, but I did well in my lane, why am I not climbing? Or, but look here, I solo killed my lane, but my bot's still lost. If you, if you say these things, you're just making excuses for yourself. You're not actually going to come in with an open mindset. You're not going to be able to improve. Um, and again, Diamond to Master is all about the map, so it's not good enough to only win your lane if you want to reliably climb. You've got to win your lane, translate leads. Third thing I found is that uh, a lot of diamond players are not willing to put into the work, put in the work to get to master plus. Like mentally, they've achieved their goal of saying like, "Oh, I've got to diamond, I'm happy." So whenever they lose a game in diamond, they have this invisible narrative saying things like, "Oh, it's not a big deal, I lost. I'm happy with diamond anyway. Like I'm gonna get diamond border, cool. Uh, I did my job this game. Oh well, I won my lane, but you know my bot lane lost. Oh well." I can still win Clash. Um, I don't have the natural talent anyway, or, you know, I would be good in competitive anyway. My solo queue rank's not that important. Like, I'm actually a diamond solo queue player, but I'm a challenger competitive player. You know, these sorts of things. And fourth, this is because, um, this is where actually a lot of players cap out because their champion pool is actually so poor. Um, they get to diamond being like a cat one trick or a Vlad one trick and or whatever it is you play. But then there's a reason these champions are not played as much in high elo. It's because they're not as reliable and they can only be picked in niche situations. This is where the old D1 Katarina player picks up um, Oriana and goes to D4. Um, or the you know the D1 Vlad player picks up Syndra and then goes to D4. It's the same thing, rinse, repeat. This is why I don't recommend one tricking because you're not a you're not a diamond one mid laner if you one trick cat. You're actually a diamond one Katarina player and most likely a platinum one or a D4 mid laner. So my advice for climbing out of diamond, drop the ego and ask these questions. Am, ask yourself these questions. Am I willing to put in the work in my VOD review and take my solo queue seriously to even get to master tier? Am I willing to have a consistent solo queue schedule? Am I willing to expand my champion pool and take the short-term loss of LP? Um, or you know, am I, is my ego too fragile and I'm scared I'm going to get flamed by my friends? Genuine question, man. I'm not trying to flame. It's a genuine question. Two, don't overwhelm yourself with all the things mentioned in this video. Diamond to Master is a long journey for a reason. All of the small details take time to make muscle memory. But this is what makes League fun. If League was a very basic game, no, not many people would actually play it. So keep that in mind. And stop wasting time thinking about things like KDAs, MMR, and win rates. I answer a question every day about how do I fix my MMR? Um, what do you think about my KDA? I'll look at my win rates. And why people always remake accounts to think about, to like get the coolest win rate to diamond and then make a new account and do the same win rate. I don't care. It doesn't matter. You haven't even got challenger before. Like, talk to me when you've got to challenger. Talk to me when you've got rank one. You know, like, why are you flexing on other diamonds? Diamond in the grand scheme is not that good. Like, the, the difference between like a diamond one player and a grandmaster player or a challenger player is probably as big as diamond to gold. It's literally that big. So I don't want to hear it and stop wasting your time on KDAs and Marn win rates. So finally, we're at Master Plus here, guys. This is going to be for the climb from Master to Challenger. This is going to be quite detailed. I don't really recommend you focus too much on all these things because if you're lower than this because it's all going to be about the one percenters. But if you're interested, feel free to keep watching. Now, 
these are the things that I focused on when I'm looking at pro players, coaching pro players, whether I'm get, helping people to get to challenger, whether I'm focusing on myself, trying to get myself to challenger over the past few seasons um, where I've gotten challenger, this is what I look for. So the first thing I tried to look for is um, how well, how well are they at, how good are they at making creative adaptions on the fly, given their assessment of jungle location. So using the information of them showing on the map to dictate where they will be next, what their resources will be like, and where they will recall. So a bit, this is a big one. So what I mean by this is, say you're versing an enemy Elise, and you see the Elise at level 5 show top lane and fail a gank. To the average mid laner, it's not going to mean anything. I mean, all they'll think about is, cool, the mid lane is top. I can play how it's an isolated 1v1. Brilliant. That's a good piece of information. But let's take that to the next level. This is where you can press tab, count the CS. You can see, you should use your hotkeys to see what, how much HP mana they are on. Um, and also your information about jungling to see which camps are going to be up and what path they've actually done. And then you should be thinking, Ah, uh, okay, now I know these are literally the places where they can be. So either this Elise is going to be on top side, invading the enemy jungle, where uh, the, my, uh, my teammate's jungle, where I can actually collapse and kill. Is the Elise low, uh, high enough HP where they can dive top, where I can counter gank that? Or is this Elise just full cleared, there's no camps on the map, going to reset, come back on the bot side, where I can actually deep ward, spot out this Elise on bot side jungle? Or uh, is this Elise going to go back to top side jungle, where I can actually push the mid wave and actually pick them in jungle because I'm playing Echo and they've got not much HP. Again, I'm thinking about not only where they are now, but where they will be, what the decision is going to be after that because this is going to help me dictate all my next move and creative adaptions. I can't think about this in champ select. I can only think about this on the fly. I'm using my information to go, go, go. How can I make a creative play using this information? Next, itemization choices. So maybe the enemy is not building... Maybe I'm the only AP on the team, um, and there's like some creative or differing build paths I can actually do, um, because then they can't stack this resistance. Or maybe I'm playing, you know, Pantheon, and instead of going into Black Cleaver, I just go Triple Lethality. So just like optimizing uh, itemization in general, and creative itemization to counter a team completely. Like maybe you're playing Galio, and that 1 in 100 game, or 1 in 50 game, you actually build Adaptive Helm, when most games it's actually not that good. Um, you know, that sort of thing, okay, just in-depth in, in itemization choices. And, actually, always updating your information about what the enemy's built. So, if the enemy builds a stopwatch before a fight, that should actually completely change how you play that fight. So, a lot of people in Diamond don't even assess, um, they don't check what they've built, because that changes the amount of threat you have on the enemy. Um, make creative adaptions based off the pace of the game. So again, if the game's playing being played at a very fast pace, they know exactly what to do to complement that. If the game's being played at a very slow pace, they know how to, to adapt to that situation. And um, maybe otherwise, if the game was being played fast, they would push and move. If it's playing slow, maybe they play to a certain item. They don't want to make any risky plays. What summoners are available? Now, again, you should be given your information on timing summoners of, in every single role. Um, you should know how that will dictate your next play, including TP. So if you're making a bot lane dive, you should also be taking into account, does top lane have TP? I literally see it all the time, really good players. They will say, does top have TP before they go for a bot lane dive? Or maybe they'll go for a top lane dive, um, but they're not taking into account mid has TP. This is where you really start to... It takes time, and even literally exhaust and heal in bot lane. You should be thinking, do they have heal and exhaust? Because that, again, that can largely influence if that bot dive is going to work. Um, how the side lanes are actually trading and what is happening with the waves, and specifically what's happening with the waves. So if you notice, bot lane is not only taking good trades, but they're able to build waves, like zone them, and you see they're building a wave. You can actually pan your camera bot, see they're building a wave, and they actually say, um, ping on the way, and then you quickly shove out your wave and go bot. I do that all the time on Rumble. I, I see that my bot lane is building a big wave. I'll literally sometimes even shove half the wave if I don't have time, because I want to time my roam as the wave's going to crash, and then I will dive. So it's all the small little details there, again, to make creative adaptions, given the information that you know. Two, um, again, this leads me to, uh, to assessing how aware are they of the side lanes in general? Are they able to know who's building waves on each side? So maybe actually your teammate is getting a wave built into them. And maybe you can actually prevent that dive by hovering them. 
And another next level thing, maybe you can see your bot lane is, say you're coming out of base and you know that you have a little bit of tempo. Uh, and you see that your bot lane's getting uh, a big wave built into them. You can actually walk straight down bot lane to hover them and counter the dive or, um, or look for a gank on that lane, given that you know that they're going to be looking to poke under tower and utilize that built wave. So this is where uh, wave location really comes into play. Um, again, you should be timing summoners in all roles. That's just a, a like a standard of play. You should be doing that. Um, effectiveness of usage of tempo. So when they do get tempo, how well are they actually using it? When they do get priority, how well are they using their priority? Are they using it in a very efficient way? Are their roams effective? Are their hovers effective? Um, are they doing little things to generate more threat on their hover? Um, also, tempo generation in general and foresight around win conditions given or game state assessment. So maybe they know um, that you know they're going to get outscaled or they need to do things on this spike. They know their bot lane's actually spiked. So maybe they do some weird way of tempo creation in mid lane, knowing that they can dive bots and they need to do things based off that's their win condition. Again, just all just similar to stuff to Diamond and other other levels. Uh, uh, sorry, like Diamond and Platinum. But again, it's the usage of the tempo because it's one one part of it is, is the, the assessment and the usage of tempo. But the next level is how effective are you actually using it? And is this the best way to use that tempo? Uh, optimization of picking the correct chance. Now, this is a big one. Now, Winning in Master Plus and getting to Challenger, it's a big one because, as we all know, and I talk about a lot, a lot this, uh, this, I talk about this a lot in my videos is threat level. So threat is a great way to generate first move off the lane and just generate options for your jungler. And I talk about this in my drafting fundamentals video how threat um, generates options for your jungler. Now, when I'm in the champ select, I, if I see a lot of immobile champions and I've got maybe a Rek'Sai. I'm not just thinking about my 1v1 matchup. I'm actually thinking of how can my champion influence multiple champions in the game and complement my own team's champions. So maybe I would pick Galio here, even though it's not maybe the best 1v1 matchup, but I know that I just counter all the enemy champs. Or maybe, you know, the most obvious example is like when uh, you're versing like a full AP team with no sustained damage and then you just pick Mundo or something like that, you know, in top lane. Um, but yeah, picking the correct champions in draft to complement damage bread, CC, range assessment, micro interactions is all very, very important. Um, and I talk about that a lot in my drafting fundamentals video. Micro optimization in skirmishes and team fights and in lane. So are you missing skill shots unnecessarily? Every skill shot is incredibly important. Maybe missing that Zoe bubble is literally the difference between getting that gank off or not, or winning that lane or not. And that, that's actually a funny thing. This is why Zoe is such a hard champion, what, such a good champion. If you are good at Zoe, if you land two bubbles in lane, the lane's over. If you're very good at Zoe, you can basically win most lanes if, if you just land your skill shots. That's why it's such a hard champion to play. Um, and also... Are you missing small trading windows because they're using an ability and you know the cooldowns really, really well? And are you missing auto attacks? Weaving in auto attacks and missing auto attacks is it's very big because it adds up. Three or four auto attacks in the lane can literally make them make a, use a pot, which then do that twice. They use both pots and then you've just got a massive advantage in the lane. Something like that. Um, are they using information regarding summoners appropriately to generate more threat on the map? Like I said before, who has summoners, who doesn't? How is that influencing your decisions? Are they complementing the jungler's decisions in-game in real time? Massive. Absolutely massive. And I do this all the time, especially, and this is a skill I had to develop when playing Rumble, and I tried, this is one of the reasons I picked Rumble, wanted to learn Rumble, was because Rumble's such a, and Galio, they're such mid-jungle 2v2 champions, I was, I'm always assessing, what is my jungler doing? If my jungle is just finished full clearing and looking to dive top, I will adapt. If they're looking to invade, I will adapt. If they're looking to full clear and reset, I will adapt. Every single time on the game, I'm always thinking, adapt, adapt, adapt. What is my jungle doing? How can I compliment them? The game at the high, at this level, it's all about mid-jungle. It's not about the mid-1v1 anymore. Um, are they adapting the usage of wards given unique jungle paths? So again, testing that level of understanding of jungle pathing. Are they optimizing their usage of wards? Or are they just doing cookie cutter ward locations because they listen to it in some video and say, oh, if I just ward here, it's going to be good. No. You need to understand the specifics of the of the pathing based off this champion, based off the game state. How can you really optimize those warding um, locations? Um, and also, another thing about this one, 
and it actually happened yesterday, is if you're versing like a kindred and you know that your junglers like started the opposite side, you should help your team and, and do a creative ward, maybe ward outside the dragon pit so they can't do a vertical clear. That actually happened yesterday. We spotted out kindred doing a vertical clear uh, and it's a game changer. So that stuff, that li that stuff can literally win you games. Um, the next is creative uses of champion kit to spark uh, running against how they would traditionally want to play the champion. So what I mean by this is like Victor, I get people saying all the time, oh, that Dunn guy in NA, is he NA or you? He takes like electrocute Victor with Ignite or whatever. Yeah, he's a great Victor and he understands the situations where you can go that specific rune page. If you're gold, you're probably not going to understand the strengths or why or how that is the right... You're not going to be able to utilize the kit in a way... Um, to utilize that room page. So for example, he probably thinks, oh, okay, this is going to be a very fast paced game. I can't afford to go phase rush and futures market and farm, but I know that if I play Victor and I, with given this jungle matchup, I can actually play Victor very fast with electrocute and ignite and make it work and operate more efficiently and more effectively in this specific game. So um, effective uses of champion kits and also runes and, opt and, and the way runes and summoners play out are uh, very, very important at this elo as well. And then fake pressure, fake threat. I talk about a bit this in my other videos as well, but what I mean by that is pretending that your jungler is here. So once you've denied vision and you know that they don't have vision in river, you can pretend that your jungler's there. You can lean if the jungler ganks you from topside. Instead of panicking and flashing, just go out of vision knowing that they don't know that your jungler's not there. Um, so they, they, they can't go for that gank, but if your jungler does show on the map, that's going to have, you can't really do this fake pressure or fake threat thing because again, they're just going to see through your movements. They know the jungler's not there and fake threat, fake pressure as well. You can pretend that the jungler's going to gank them uh, and play as if there's a gank set up, but then they respect really, really far. And then you can actually get the wave and get a free, um, free wave of priority when you wouldn't have otherwise. So this is where not only thinking about your vision, but what vision they have. And you can do this by assessing when they use their warding trinkets, uh, where you have pink wards, and if they actually bought a pink coming out of base. Um, mid game is massive. It's a massive area to highlight. So this is where mid game really comes into play. Mid game is much more important in Diamond Master tier. Um, even, probably not even as much in Diamond, mainly in Master tier. So I look for things like this. Are they calling off or on certain plays given the win conditions? How accurately are they are they assessing the win condition? And more importantly, if they know they have a very ultimate centric team, are they willing to make that call, guys? Let's give up this dragon. Let's wait for our ultimates, or let's wait for our key spikes, and then we can play for this. Then we can play for this objective, or let's trade this dragon for top tower because we really need gold. Uh, you know, like I want to be seeing that person make proactive macro calls based off their assessment of the game. Are they making sacrifices of tempo, XP, CS in order to make a creative play? In high elo, you can't just play cookie cutter League of Legends. Sometimes, and if you watch high elo in Korean Chinese solo queue, they do crazy weird things um, because they know it's going to catch people off guard. If you play the same way every single time and play, you know, the scaling Victor every single time, they're just going to know exactly where you are. You're going to generate no threat and it's going to be hard for you to find a kill. So a lot of the time, sometimes you'd be like, all right, I'm actually going to sacrifice tempo on this wave or XP, these few creeps, because I know that they're going to be coming out of base here. I know that my top lane is built to wave and I can make this dive play. So using information on the map, willingly sacrificing, making sacrifices to make a play. Okay. So it's another interesting thing. Um, and actually, another interesting thing about this one in mid game is if you are maybe a side lane champion, and instead of like, um, and what you can actually do is your jungler, get your jungler to just like skip camps or whatever, and make him come like lane gank and actually lane gank someone or sit in the side lane brush at a sacrifice of XP. So maybe you miss the CS, but that's actually going to send signals to the enemy that you're not there. And then you make like a side lane play or something like that. Maybe that's a little bit too complicated. I'm not, maybe I'm not explaining it well, but, um, for those of you who understand then cool. Um, are they abusing the lack of information the enemy team has? Like I said this before. So what this one is, is, um... Again, what information do they know of your jungler? So if your jungler is hasn't shown on the map, you should know that. If your jungler has shown on the map, you should also know that because that largely dictates what you can do. So if you're in the side lane and mid game as well, right? If they know where your jungler is, your jungler's showing on the map, they're going to know you have no backup. 
which means you probably can't shove it out. Okay, so um, knowing what information they know about your team is very important. Um, are they thinking about where the enemy will path out of base to make creative picks in the side lane jungle? I spoke about this before, but again, um, knowing where the enemy is going to path out of base to make creative picks, very, very important. Are they assessing Baron sneak potential? If you're playing something like Casio Azir, you've got like an Aphelios at two items, you can just rush Baron randomly. Are they pushing limits in the side lane hard enough to make the enemy's life incredibly hard? This is a massive, 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 I can't stress this, this is massive. Now, if you're playing something like Echo in the side lane, a big thing I see is like a diamond player. They like they're playing well. They're playing really well. It's just not ta they're not taking it to the next level because they're like, okay, my jungler's not here. I'm not safe. I'm gonna play back. But their mindset should be at the master tier levels plus is like, I know that I am threatened and I know that I could get ganked. But I'm gonna. I know that. Because they don't have this person doesn't have flash, and I know they don't have too much threat on me. I can really push my limits and make it so annoying for them because they don't know if I'm overextending or not. So they're going to be wasting time, maybe hovering me, trying to gank me, but then they can't gank me. They waste time. We get more control on the other side of the map, and then you know we get we can create an opportunity to make a play. So it's like pushing limits in a way and understanding micro interactions to be really, um, really make the enemy's life a living hell. Um, are they abusing TP summoner CDs? So, um, what I mean by this one is, um, do they know if the enemy has no TP in which they can side lane, tell the team, oh guys, I got TP advantage, wait for something to happen, and like, or wait for someone to go on the side lane, then TP to a fight? Like, are they, are, are they abusing TP summoner cooldowns? 12, champion mastery overall. How well do they know their champion? Really, really important. You can't, if you don't have champion mastery, you don't know all the small little details about your champion, um, you're just not going to climb in this in this elo. Now, improving these key areas. Number one, this is where watching one tricks of your champion come in handy, okay? So watching the best, and, and watching the best solo queue players in the world. So this is because you can actually understand all the small things that they're doing. When a platinum player watches a high elo player or like a one trick on a specific champion, they're probably not going to be able to respect or understand all the small things that they're doing. Like someone like a gold or platinum player watching Dopa, they probably only they don't really understand what makes Dopa good. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just because they're not at that level yet. This is also why I'm an advocate for high elo coaches. Why I think all coaches, it's like how can you coach a player if you're not at that level in a way? Like because you just don't understand all these things. Um, but yeah, if you're a one, if you play Echo and you want to learn more about Echo, watch the one trick and you're going to be able to see all the small things that they do to level up your game. So pay attention to every movement like I do in my pro play insight video. So actually watch my pro play insight video, my recent one on, um, Showmaker, literally watch how I do that. I literally break down every small decision and I'm not just saying everything they do is correct. I'm trying to play devil's advocate. Oh, here they do something well. I think that's why they would do that. Here they, I don't really agree with that because of this. Um, paying attention to every small detail. Try to ask for second opinions and do VOD reviews with other people to see if you are interpreting the situation in other roles accurately. Because Master Plus requires a lot of game knowledge, not just in your role, like in every single lane on every single role, it can really help out with your pre-game assessment and allows you to accurately create a, a strategy and identify win conditions and also helps you pick champions that synergize well with your teammates. So asking for information from junglers or top laners or bot lane or whatever it is can really level up your game. And so consider adding other pro players or other high low players to discuss matchups. Some findings guys. So. Master players don't understand how big the difference is between low master and challenger. This is generally because of their ego, or maybe they're like so stuck in their ways, they're not willing to change and accept the harsh reality. But this is why talking to other people can really get you out of that nasty hole. And, and so keep in mind, guys, that the difference between master and challenger is literally bigger than plat 1 to d1. It, it's massive. The difference between master and challenger is actually probably bigger than plat 1 to d1. It could be even like plat 4 to d1. It's really, really big. It's all those small details. Generally, a low master tier player doesn't have anywhere near the game knowledge of a challenger player, just in straight game knowledge of every role. That's actually why you'll find is that a lot of remember back in the day, um, people always used to get so surprised at like Korean pro players being able to play multiple roles. 
they do that on purpose so they can understand more things. So Faker or like all these jungle like mid laners, they play jungle really well because they need to understand how jungle operates at a high level or they play AD carry really well, or they can play most lanes really well because they understand the theory behind it, even if they don't know the micro as well. Um, I've also found that climbing from master to challenge, is, it's like the hardest part of the journey. And most of the time it's a mental game. So take the time to reflect and identify your own mental blocks and barriers you've built because they're absolutely crucial to identify for climbing. And sometimes it can actually be helped through coaching or even just playing on a second account to play differing champions, just to give you a different uh, mindset or give you a refresh mentally or even help break down some of those mental barriers. Three, uh, mental resilience within a game is absolutely crucial. You are bound to get punched in the face. You're gonna get punched in the face at some point when playing in these games. How you react and adapt within these games is absolutely crucial and it's the name of the game. So if you tilt and say 15 FF, if you die once, then you're probably not gonna get out of master tier or it's gonna be hard for you to climb reliably. So my advice for climbing to challenger is that your intensity of your practice is absolutely crucial. All the one percenters come into play now. So if you're playing with music, you're all tabbing, you're memeing in between games, all these small details can add up to ruin your focus and intensity. Remembering guys that if you lose focus for one little bit, and you give the enemy one kill, then it can literally be game over because the people are so competent at this level, they won't let you get back into the game. And a quote that's actually really helped me personally was, what got you here won't get you there. And what I mean by this is that, keep in mind that when you try and get challenger, you do have to somewhat be a meta slave and adapt to how the game is played. I've had to reinvent myself and my own identity as a player many times as the meta has shifted from season to season. What I did to get 1000 LP in season 7 would not be how I get 1000 LP in season 9. Like I'm only now around like four 400 LP in Grandmaster because I'm slowly reinventing my, my, uh, my style of play and the way I, I'm seeing the game. Now, and, and that's generally how it works for me every season. It takes me a, a long time and usually I don't peak until like the mid to the end of the, the season because that's when I come into my prime and that's when I really understand um, my identity as a player. So rather than slamming your head into the wall consistently and constantly, you need to adapt and you need to use a second account if need be. Hold yourself to a high standard mentally. If you make a mistake, don't just write it off as like a once off. And this is something I learned from, from some of my pro players working with them. And I always wondered why were they so good? Because they didn't have this mentality. They had this mentality where it's like, they make a mistake, it was for a reason, okay? You need to embrace the attention to detail mi mindset. Mistakes are a signal, right? It's a mistake or a feeling or whatever it is. It's all signals that are telling you, you need to work on it, okay? There's no such thing as just a one-off mistake. Generally, it's always for a reason. For go back over this video and you'll probably realize that maybe you are challenger level at certain elements of the game, but maybe some other some other areas you're platinum. So take time, take your time to address each one one by one. Five, don't forget to bring attention to things that you do well. Okay, so if you're focusing all the time on all the things that you're doing poorly and, and comparing yourself to others, you're going to severely ruin your confidence. And it's important to realize that, like, what got you here in the first place? You're not a bad player. If you got to master tier, like you have to be good in some areas. Like it doesn't matter if you're one trick or not. Like you have to be good in some areas to get to this level in the first place. So keep in mind guys that don't just always kind of, don't just always focus on the things you're doing poorly. Focus on the things that you're doing well. Six, you must push your limits and make mistakes in order to improve. This one, and this one's a big one. So and a perfect example of this is actually diving. You will have a lot of painful experiences with failed side lane dives because you you dive bot lane, you give a double kill, whatever, the game's over, but it's really the only way to improve. If you want to go from, again, master tier to challenger, you must test your hypothesis. If you think that this kill threat in this lane, or even if you're not sure, a lot of the time it's better to do it and learn why it wasn't or why it was because you're just not going to uh, level up that way. So thanks for watching. For those of you who actually watched this entire video, it's a very long video, a lot of theory. Even myself, my my throat's like dying and talk a lot. Um, and I, this was one, this this video is actually really hard to do, like to stay focused. 
Um, and again, this is something I'm really trying to focus on is staying focused throughout an entire video and um, working on my public speaking. So I'm just talking in front of a camera. Like I've actually been talking in front of a camera this whole time. Uh, and, and usually in a conversation in person, you get feedback from that person with their facial expressions or what they say back to you. But when you're talking to a camera, it's just you. So I don't know what I'm saying, if it's resonating or not. So any feedback is greatly appreciated. If it helps you, even if you get one thing from this video, um, that makes me really happy. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks for watching.